After getting roasted in a rap battle, I headed east on Plymouth Road and went for a stroll to try to get over myself. Eventually I did. Well, this is video number 22 in my Detroit series, where I go through the entire city. We'll be seeing a lot in this video, including the typical urban decay that is so commonly seen throughout the city, but we'll be seeing a really nice neighborhood towards the end as well. We're going to see the old headquarters for AMC, which stood for American Motors Corporation. The AMC brand went kerplunk in 1988, but it once owned one of the more recognizable American car brands. And you'll just have to watch this video to know what that brand is. If you enjoy this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the evil monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also make sure to hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. As we continue to head west on Plymouth Road past the Southfield Freeway, we're in the Granddale neighborhood, and the latest data shows that just over 7,000 people live here, and the median household income is $30,000 per year. 9% of adults 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree or higher, and the median value of owner-occupied housing units is $56,000, while the poverty rate is 33%. North of Plymouth Road, this neighborhood doesn't have many homes left standing. On the flip side, when you look at a satellite photo of the neighborhood south of Plymouth Road, you can see that there are a lot more structures. For this part of the city, I-96 parallels Plymouth Road a half mile to the north, and that could be the reason why this neighborhood has become so vacant, as when freeways were being built throughout the city, not only did that require demolition of thousands of buildings, but it created a barrier in the middle of these neighborhoods, as streets were forced to come to a dead end. And for the people who lived in these neighborhoods, the residents were no longer connected to half of their neighborhood, and that alone can drastically lower the quality of life from living in one of these neighborhoods. I-96 is otherwise known as the Jeffries Freeway throughout its path in Detroit. It was completed in multiple segments throughout the city, with the segment in the Granddale neighborhood being completed in 1973, while the neighborhood itself developed throughout the 1920s and 30s. I-96 originally was supposed to follow Grand River all the way towards Farmington, but freeway revolts in the 1960s forced the city to reroute the freeway, which is why the Jeffries ended up being one of the last Detroit freeways to get built. With the freeway revolts and to minimize the impact to the quality of life in these neighborhoods, I-96 ended up being built along the right-of-way of some railroad lines, along with being built on top of a major surface road for a long stretch, that road being Schoolcraft Road. And with that construction, it forced the demolition of many businesses along Schoolcraft. Now, in my opinion, freeway building throughout Detroit is a big player into why the city has declined because after these freeways were completed, it made it easy to live out in the suburbs and commute to a job in the city. It's certainly not the only reason though, and I would also argue that it's not as big of a reason as some make it out to be because if the problems in the city weren't there in the first place, then there wouldn't be as high of a demand to live in the suburbs or for these freeways to be built. On the left, you can start to see the building that was originally the headquarters for AMC, or the American Motors Corporation. Even though we're passing by it now, I won't be talking about it until later in the video. Meanwhile, most of the area of Detroit that we go through in this video will be within the 48227 zip code. Overall, this zip code is home to 39,000 people. People? The median household income is $31,000 per year, and only 9% of adults 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree or higher. The median value of owner-occupied housing units is $56,000, and the poverty rate is 33%. So those aren't good numbers, as you can tell. But it's not unique to what we see throughout Detroit, as most of the residential areas in the city have very similar economic stats. So yes, 
We'll come back to this spot later and talk about what was AMC and its significance in both automotive and Detroit history. For now, we're going to continue to head down Plymouth Road until we get to Wyoming. Now, at the beginning of this drive, we saw a lot more traffic and there was at least a decent amount of places that were open for business, but now there's like almost nothing and there's very little traffic as we get deeper into the hood. Well, now we're going to skip things ahead to a neighborhood near Grand River and Myers, and if you want to see any of the lost footage that I filmed to make this video but didn't include in this video, then make sure to check out my second channel that is linked down below called Chris Harden's Travel Archives, and on it, you'll be able to see more of the residential side streets in this section of the city, because for most of this video, I'll be sticking to the main thoroughfares, with a few exceptions like this clip that I'll show you here. Now, the spring and summer of 2021 brought a lot of severe storms to the Detroit area, and just about every other week you would see headlines for flooding in vulnerable areas, including several of the freeways, as about half of Detroit's freeways were built below street level, or as people around here say, urban trenches. But the day that I filmed this video was probably not long after one of those storms, so you'll be seeing high water in spots throughout this video. Anyway, this area is just yet another residential neighborhood that has ended up being a shell of its former self. When you have a city that was once home to nearly 2 million people during its peak years, only to have that number fall to 600,000, most of the city is going to be abandoned, so this really shouldn't be a surprise, and quite frankly, it should be a surprise when you come across a nice neighborhood. Now that's not to offend anyone, because throughout this Detroit series I've been making sure to pinpoint all of the nice neighborhoods that are still in good shape throughout the city, while at the same time keeping it real, because 
While we've been seeing the comeback efforts in downtown, and the neighborhoods that surround downtown, this is the real Detroit. Abandoned, neglected, and a large portion of the residents who have stayed are living in poverty, unfortunately so. And the city's infrastructure has suffered and so have the public schools and other city services such as police and fire. It's all a downward spiral, people, and the only way for Detroit to come back is if the city is able to do things the right way for an extended period of time. And I'm talking about decades, because so much of this large, spread out city looks like this. You know, another factor is that there has to be a demand for living here in order for the city to come back. And that factor is going to be difficult to achieve if the city continues to have an extremely high crime rate going forward, along with a reputation for poor police response times, poorly rated public schools, which are often ranked as some of the worst in the country, and to make things worse, Detroit issues some of the highest property taxes for a city in the nation, which is going to make people not want to move back into the city even more especially when the larger metro area has so many other cities to live in that provide a better quality of life in essentially every category. Point is, is that it's going to be really hard for the city to make a true comeback, and it's going to take an extremely long time. If Detroit is ever able to achieve such a comeback in the distant future, it will truly be one of the most impressive accomplishments for a city in this country's history, to rise, fall, and then rise again. And Hopefully the momentum can continue to spread outwards from the downtown comeback efforts and eventually reach areas of the city like this. Well, now let's go back to the area of Plymouth and Hubble so we can talk about AMC. To the right is the old headquarters for AMC or the American Motors Corporation. AMC formed in Detroit through a merger of two car companies, one being the Nash Kelvinator Corporation and the other being the Hudson Motor Car Company. Now, it's possible that many of you have never heard of any of these car brands before. Admittedly, these names were actually pretty new to me before filming this video, but in the same breath, none of these car brands existed in my lifetime, so I don't feel bad about it. That's right, people. I ain't no dinosaur. I'm a dog. Ooh, ooh. Oh. Yeah, uh, I have no idea what that was. All right, well, yeah, um, okay. Well, yeah, anyway, all right. Anyway, this merger happened in 1954, and believe it or not, it was the largest corporate merger in US history at the time. AMC had a long-term plan to include not only the Nash and Hudson brands, but also the Studebaker and Packard brands. A good example of this would be General Motors, as GM formed through a consolidation of automotive brands such as Cadillac, Chevrolet, Pontiac, and Oldsmobile. The idea behind this AMC merger was to give these automotive brands a larger budget to be able to better compete with the big three automakers in Ford, Chrysler, and GM. Three years later, in 1957, the Nash and Hudson brands were replaced by the Rambler and Metropolitan brands, and Rambler quickly became the third most popular automotive brand in the US behind Ford and Chevy. However, the return on investment from newer vehicles and brands within AMC never ended up bringing a profit to the company, and throughout the company's history, managing finances was a big struggle. Well, later on, there were some other brands, such as Javelin and AMX, and in 1970, AMC bought out Jeep, which, for some of you, that might be the first and only AMC brand that I've mentioned that you'll know about. AMC was a brand itself, and after Jeep was purchased, AMC focused on investing mainly in the AMC and Jeep brands. In 1985, Chrysler partnered with AMC, and because of AMC's financial struggles, a part of the deal allowed Chrysler to use AMC's factories for Chrysler's vehicles. In 1987, the last AMC vehicle was manufactured, and Jeep continued to be owned by Chrysler. Today, Chrysler isn't even its own company anymore, as it's owned by an overseas company called Stellantis, but that's beside the point. And not sure what was going on at this park, but you have an old telephone pole on the ground and some tents set up. Not gonna assume anything, but yeah, I don't know. Anyway, the building that most notably housed what was AMC's headquarters was built from 1926 to 1927. It was originally an appliance manufacturing facility owned by the company that was Kelvinator. 
In the mid-1930s, the automaker Nash Motors merged with Kelvinator to create Nash Kelvinator, and in 1940, the Plymouth Road facility expanded to include car manufacturing. The factory also made helicopters during World War II and saw yet another expansion once Hudson merged with Nash Kelvinator to create AMC. In 1968, the Kelvinator brand went away and by 1973, AMC moved their corporate offices to the Detroit suburb of Southfield while keeping their engineering headquarters at the Detroit Plymouth Road location until 1987 when the brand went away. During the 1990s, the factory continued to be used, however, and for a brief moment, it was leased by Borman Food Stores and Farmer Jack. In 2007, Chrysler filed for bankruptcy, and the plant closed for good in 2009, and it sat here vacant ever since. Recently, the city sold the property to North Point Development, a company that has already begun the demolition process. I visited the site again just a few days before uploading this video, which was February 1st, 2023 to be exact, and the tower portion of the complex had already been demolished. You can see that progress is well underway. You know, Detroit's Mayor Mike Duggan has been aggressively trying to demolish several of Detroit's massive and old abandoned automotive factories like no other Detroit mayor has. So while on one hand it's sad to see these relics that made Detroit the Motor City go away, it's ultimately a good thing for the city to move on from its industrial past. Along with the deal, North Point was able to buy 26 residential lots that bordered the 56-acre site, and North Point will also pay for the environmental cleanup. The Detroit News has a December 2021 article stating that the company plans to build two new buildings, totaling 728,000 square feet of industrial space that would be suitable for a new automotive parts supplier. And here's an illustration by North Point showing the public what their plans are exactly. And we'll just have to wait and see if this ends up being what North Point so claims, as it's been a trend in Detroit for decades now for companies to buy up these old properties only to abandon their plans halfway through, so you would be a fool to do anything other than to believe it when you see it in that sense. Now we're going to head on over to the area of Plymouth and Southfield and we're going to check out what is mostly an abandoned neighborhood. It's the northern part of the Granddale neighborhood. And after that, we'll check out a pretty nice neighborhood actually called Grandmont which is completely opposite from this neighborhood that we're seeing right here. This neighborhood right here is just bounded by the Southfield Freeway on one side and I-96 on the north side. And then you have Plymouth Road on the south side. There's some businesses off of Plymouth Road, sure, but the area between Plymouth Road and I-96 for this portion of land is just mostly abandoned, with a few homes still standing here and there. But I told you this episode was action-packed, didn't I? And it's not even over, because Grandmont, if you like nice neighborhoods, has yet to be seen in this video.
So from here, I'll skip things ahead to where I'm heading west on Schoolcraft Road from Greenfield Road, and we'll check out the Schoolcraft Road corridor along with the Grandmont neighborhood for the rest of this video. Once again, to see all of the lost footage that I filmed but didn't end up using in this video, make sure to check out my second channel, as I'll be uploading all of the lost footage on there, and the link for that is down below. So the Grandmont neighborhood officially became a part of Detroit in 1923. However, nearly 100 years before that, the neighborhood that's today, bounded by Grand River, Southfield, Schoolcraft, and Asbury Park, was deeded by then-president Andrew Jackson to a guy named Thomas Norton in 1835. 40 acres of it was purchased by a family known as the Davids later on, in which their original farmhouse still stands at the corner of Rutland and Southfield. Now that's cool. Can you imagine a farm being here, by the way? It's tough for me to do, but yes, there was a farm here, and the original farmhouse still stands. Pretty neat. Well, in the early 1900s, the Davids refused to sell their 40 acres to developers unless the developers promised to plant maple trees on both sides of what eventually became Rutland Street. And that's what ended up happening. So by 1916, the Grandmont neighborhood was platted, and 800 residential lots were drawn out exactly, and houses started to get built. And once again in 1923, the neighborhood officially became a part of Detroit. Northwest of here is another nice neighborhood that doesn't get mentioned much, that being Rosedale Park, and I'll go through it in another video. Technically, since I turned south on Archdale, I'm not in Grandmont, but you wouldn't be able to tell the difference as both sides of this street are full of occupied two-story homes just like the streets in Grandmont are. With that said, there's about 2,400 people that call Grandmont's home today. The median household income is $55,000 per year, and 23% of adults 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree or higher. And the median value of owner-occupied housing units is $127,000. And if you've been following along in my Detroit series, those economic stats for a Detroit neighborhood are really good. If you're one of those who loves Detroit and just absolutely hates the idea of living out in the suburbs, Grandmont would be a good neighborhood to buy a house in.
And now, technically, since we're north of Schoolcraft, we are officially in Grandmont. Very small neighborhood, but a very nice neighborhood, especially by Detroit standards. And the area just south of it, where we just were, isn't all that bad either. Well, I continued my drive around this area of Detroit. I went everywhere from streets that resemble more so of an off-road trail rather than a city street to familiar sites like this pharmacy and the Tower Center Mall off of Grand River and Greenfield. So make sure to check out my second channel to see all of that and all of the other lost footage that I filmed but didn't use in this video on my main channel, a part of the Detroit series. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the evil monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also make sure to hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, then you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos with amazing insights on other places like what you saw here can be found in my Detroit playlist, my American Hoods playlist, or in my Michigan playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. We'll see you next time. Peace!